and I took him onto the roof where there's a small roof garden, and there's at least five or six varieties of flowers going there, <coughs> very common ones, but he didn't know the name of any of them. <laughs> Ruskin Bond is a renowned author who lives among the mountains in Uttarakhand. Born in Kasoli, Himachal Pradesh, he grew up in Jamnagar, Gujarat, Dehradun and Shimla. He wrote his first book, The Room on the Roof, in 1956. Since then, he has authored more than 500 short stories, essays and novels with 70-plus books for children. He was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award in 1992, the Padma Shri in 1999 and Padma Bhushan in 2014. In an interaction for the Forest of Life Festival, Ruskin talks about nature writing and his own journey as a writer. Let's watch it. So let's start with talking about what do you feel is the importance of forest in our lives? Well, you know, we are very fortunate in India that we have forests. Uh, so many great forests from the Himalaya down to uh, the, the far south, uh, with, with perhaps just a, a few, one or two states where um, there's some desert. But when you think of other countries, North Africa and the Sahara and others, it's where it's, it's rare to find a tree even. Hmm? Uh, we, we have to realize how fortunate we are to have forests. And not only um, timber forests, but also I think there's no country in the world that has the same as as great a variety of fruits um, as we have in India. You know, every tropical fruit you can think of, every temperate fruit you can think of. Hmm? So, so, well, why do we need forests? Of course, it's obvious we need them for hmm, uh, for our to keep our climate in ba well balanced, huh? um, and um, and also for the protection not just of our natural world or the wildlife, uh, but for our own our own um, well-being. Um, so the, the the gradual, I would say, diminishing of our forest wealth has perhaps not been very dramatic, but it has been steady, I think, over hmm, a number of years, um, simply because of the the expansion of, of cities and uh, urban areas, basically. Yeah? You, you can just see it from my window. If you look down at the Dune Valley, how, this, how the town or the city is, has now covered the entire valley, whereas 20, 30 years ago, it, it would have been only perhaps half that, hmm, ex half that extent. So and that's happened in many uh, areas uh, of the country where town, villages have become towns, towns have become cities and cities have become mega cities uh, and, um, and, and the, our dwellings and uh, have just taken over um, not, not just forest land but even agricultural land. So I think we, we need at least to um, preserve what we what is left to us and if possible increase it um, so we need not just to um, save our trees but to have more of them and not just with the usual business of a VIP going and planting a tree uh, symbolically and then it's usually forgotten afterwards <laughs> you go there uh, maybe a year or two later you won't find that tree because uh, nobody's bothered to perhaps look after it. Um, so it's really not so much a question of of trees will look after themselves and then a forest will will spread on its own if it's given a chance. Hmm? Because they are, most trees are gregarious, especially forest trees. So where you where you find a few, you will find more after some time. Um, so it's it's really a, a question of of protecting our heritage mm. in many way. So you have mentioned that 
you became a children writer by serendipity by chance right but nature writing seems to be a conscious choice with you i guess it was always there um, but uh, even in my early writing but more it perhaps was more so when i left uh, um, i used to live in the cities i lived in delhi for f- five or six years in in london for four or five years um but uh, Uh, so uh, there you are perhaps um, you have to search sometimes for for nature mm? Mm. um uh, go outside the town or the city or or find a, a garden or a park um so it was really only when i came to live in the hills um in the mid 60s 1960s uh, that i became closer to nature um i wasn't then in this a house building which is on top of the mountain but little lower down uh, near the forest hmm? yes at maplewood cottage um and um i was there for about 10 years and i became very familiar with the the surroundings with the little forest that was near the cottage there were oh, uh, quite a mixed forest of oak trees maple walnut and then further down open hillsides wild flowers amazing the variety of wild flowers and then of course <laughs> there were villages too uh, as we went further on and um, and uh, the villagers lived generally in harmony with the f- with with their surroundings with the forest and, hmm? and um, as they always have done uh, when you come to think of it this hill station has been here about 150 years roughly but the surrounding villages have been here thousands of years and and very often have been uh, just ignored um so so their life is only now changing um because of the um it's it because so it's so easier now to communicate eh? um in in, the, in not just through roads but also through you know, technology um so i think it's 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 wonderful in a way that we are now taking it seriously uh, the environment mm-hmm. and that um uh children are being encouraged even to write about nature uh, that's a wonderful idea that they sh- uh, should write we encourage to write nature stories or mm-hmm. or or um which i've been doing for so long if they all start writing they they all put me out of business i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> but I'd uh, be happy if they do. Hmm? Um and uh, I've noticed too that um you see when uh, we just took the natural world for granted when I was a boy at school boy or even in the 1950s 60s nobody thought twice about going and cutting a tree there was even in around Missouri on the north face the Camel's Back Road huge uh, beautiful deodars were just cut away just for the value of the timber um so there weren't any restrictions you know at least now we do have restrictions huh? and um although occasionally they're flouted so i think the, the consciousness of the importance of forests and trees and nature and all the things that uh, <clears throat> that live in forests uh, is is permeating hmm, the the land and and uh, and the education system which is all important huh? teachers are more conscious of the importance of nature and the environment and and children get enthusiastic about it too which is wonderful i i've noticed that some of my stories which had <coughs> Uh, the element of nature in them or the theme or subject which <coughs> perhaps in the in the 1960s and 70s weren't read much but now i find the uh, to my delight that those particular stories and books are are in demand so uh, i'm benefiting too in a way and we and we all will i think benefit from uh uh our relationship with the natural world in especially in today's context nature writing 
and especially for children you need to why do you think it's important sir i think we live basically in a in a world that is um where nature is eventually dominant and it um but but i think mankind has tried to dominate nature oh you know over the centuries huh? and um has to some extent succeeded <coughs> but but has in the long run failed because <coughs> we are perfectly helpless when it comes to a an earthquake or a tsunami or um, or a, or a hurricane or a typhoon um and uh, i think so we 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 perhaps should realize that we are not <coughs> supermen we are we are just um um uh, we are we are beneficiaries of nature in in uh, in a sense we we survive because of it over the centuries man has depended on nature for his food and for his uh, um shelter and everything that that's there so we sort of come to take it for granted <coughs> until we start losing it and suffer because of that loss i I've, i've often been asked um by young people or old people what uh, i uh, how can i be happy they say and i often them as <coughs> a very simple answer grow something i will say you know if if you've got space create a garden if you have more space grow trees <coughs> if you don't have space put something in your window you know have the, the, watch the miracle of life you know there's nothing more exciting i think that you plant a seed then watch it come up and grow into a into a plant or a flower or a fruit tree or a forest um and uh, when i was <coughs> I know when I was a boy and I I went to London and I was living in a very uh gloomy part of the city um and I had a small bed sitting room with just a tiny window where this little, little bit of sunlight would come in for half an hour in the morning so it was a bit depressing <coughs> and then one day I just I I had a bean seed which um by chance it came my way and i put it in a little pot of earth and kept it in the window and to my amazement a week or two later after what did it a little bean sprouted uh, and it 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 made me wake up in a way huh? <laughs> and i watched that bean in this little gloomy um <coughs> room in london getting bigger and taller and taking over the window hmm? and um as the bean progressed even i progressed in a way i sort of it had a psychological effect on me um <clears throat> uh, i became it gave me hope so i think when you see something growing and and giving forth fruit and flower it also gives gives you hope and uh, mm, a feeling that life is worthwhile <laughs> yes sir so <laughs> that that's like your moment of uh, you know epiphany like when when is of course you describe in when you were in the uk mm. uh the great britain at that time we had gone by the sea and there was this incident where he said that the at that time we decided that he just had to come back. yes right i was in jersey you you remember that you uh, you read that in one of uh, yes. in my member i think yeah i i was i'd left i'd i'd finished school in india and I'd, my mother packed me off to england and uh to relatives in the channel islands <coughs> uh, jersey but i wasn't happy that i was missing india i was longing to come back and uh, but i was stuck i didn't have much money so i had a very ordinary job at the time um working in an office and um but then one night late one evening as it just as it got dark i took a walk along the at the seafront uh uh it was very lonely and, and there was a storm brewing up in it wind and the waves were crashing ag- against the seawall but it sort of gave inspired me in a way and i 
told myself, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to write and, um, and I'm going to make a living out of it. And I'm going to go back to India. So I made, I think the elements therefore had somehow in, uh, taken over. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and, uh, I, and that's what I did then. So and the very next day I, <clears throat> I left my relatives in Jersey and, and went to London. <clears throat> Of course, I had to work there too. <laughs> uh, but I st started writing or finishing my first book. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Then when I got a publisher finally, and in those days they gave you an advance of 50 pounds, that was the standard advance. But for 40 pounds brought you back to India. Yeah, yes. the, the, the fare by sea was uh, 40 pounds. Everyone traveled by sea in those days because the air, air services were still rather primitive. Um, even in India, that all my early stories were about trains <laughs> because everyone traveled by train then. No? Uh, they were no, the uh, air services were just sort of um, pick, picking up. And the, and the, the airports aren't that uh, you know as interesting as the train stations. Yes, and in fact, one of my earliest stories, and the one that's still very popular, is about the train stopping at this tiny little station right in the depths of the forest. Um, Karlsrau, I call it the only in, in, in the story. And it's a station in the jungle. It's still there. There's little less jungle around it now than there used to be, obviously. <coughs> People have been clearing it. But um, but there was something very, uh, I could say, well, romantic about it. Mm, but uh, somehow the idea of uh, forests and jungle always appealed to me as a writer, mm, as well as a person. I guess the next time when you speak about how nature changed the course of your life, mm. when you you were living in Delhi, you yes. came here on the hills and you Maplewood Cottage and you saw the thing and that's when you decided that no, I can't continue, I have to become a freelance mm -hmm. writer again. Even when I was in Delhi, you see, in the early 1960s, the, at that time I was staying in a colony called Rajori Gardens, which was on the outskirts. And across the road, there were just fields. Now those fields have all gone. There are colonies there too. <coughs> Tagore Gardens and Punjabi Bagh and all these places. But um, at that time, there wasn't. Rajari was the last colony. And so I used to cross the road into the fields. And uh, I got to, there were st still villages there, which have all vanished now. And I, and I, and people were using camels <laughs> instead of bullocks. So I, I, and then you could, you go to, I used to go down to the Nazafkar jail where there was a lot of bird life. I don't know if it's there at all now. And um, I think it's become a sewage dump. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing, the 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 um, the, the, the pollution that has um, perhaps uh, made, taken away the, the quality of life you know, to a great extent. You have to be maybe sensitive or um, responsive to nature in a way. Uh, from I think a young age, so perhaps it's 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 something that's um, a part of your own nature, um, which might <coughs> come to the fore as you uh, start growing older. On the other, it might not. You might not. You might just remain a very materialistic sort of person, um, <coughs> and um, but I think more and more people are now becoming responsive to nature and realizing hmm, <coughs> how important it is. And, but from a child, I think, I remember as a very small boy in Jamnagar and coming into the, there was, big, there was a big palace garden there and I must have been this high. And there are these cosmos flowers towering above me. It was like a forest of cosmos. Huh? <coughs> and I would, wander about amongst these uh, cosmos flowers and it became my favorite flower, the cosmos. Very simple flower, you know, um, 
but um, it's very fresh looking. And it used to grow <clears throat> almost semi wild up here in, uh, or in and around Missouri. But for two, three years or more, I haven't seen it. I think it's just sort of, I think too much building. Uh, there's no space for it to come up, for flowers to come up on their own uh, as they used to. So uh, I've noticed a lot of, <clears throat> uh, of wild or semi wild flowers are missing, are not growing around, are not there anymore. Some birds too are are not seen as often as one used to. So I think it's, again, it's perhaps because of the the spread and expansion of buildings, um, too much um, human activity, you could say, in a noisy way. Yes, so you feel empathy is a requirement for a nature writer, isn't it? Yeah, empathy is important, I think, yes. You, 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 you must um, well, everyone loves a flower and will say how beautiful it is, but, you know, <clears throat> just last week, a young man was talking to me and he was in his 20s. He, he, he knew everything about technology, you know, uh, and what was going on in, 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 the, in the world uh, as far as technological advances were going. He knew all about outer space. Then I took him onto the roof where there's a small roof garden, which uh, Bina made. And there's at least five or six varieties of flowers going there, <coughs> very common ones. But he didn't know the name of any of them. <laughs> he, he, I think the, he said, I don't know the names of any flowers except the rose. So he, so it was, it, I thought it was very funny that uh, there was this young man who knew everything about everything, but he didn't know the names of flowers. Huh? Uh, he didn't know the name of a daisy or a or a geranium. Uh, so, so that it struck me as um, how perhaps we have taken nature for granted. There's a disconnection there that between us. Yes. Uh, and also, in 2004, you had mentioned that nature gives and takes away and gives again. How do you maintain that? You know, that uh, sobriety is. A, Yes, but yes, maybe by um, looking at the positive side that, well, trees are being slaughtered, but maybe somewhere else they are growing and coming up. <coughs> and you can't, and you can't eliminate nature altogether, you know. It, it's, it has a habit of coming back. <laughs> it does. You, if a house is neglected or falls into um, disuse or ruin, very quickly nature takes over, you know, the, uh, the plants will start growing in it and in, and weeds and then the trees will come out of cracks, it, it will uh, soon become part of the jungle. Um, and, and that happens too. Um, it is, so there's always that thought in the back of our minds that Nature recovers. Mm. Nature recovers. A building doesn't recover once it's gone. Mm. But nature does recover and comes, you know, and and it might retreat for some time, but then it it, it advances again. So, so there's still hope it then. Mm, yes, certainly there's hope in that. It the, the human being, the the human individual is is, um, I think sympathetic towards nature yeah it's perhaps only all mass that we that we that we perhaps don't realize what we are doing <laughs>